Hello, my name is Bernhard Kerber, and together with my colleagues from TU Wien and VRVIS, I would like to welcome you to our short paper presentation of an improved triangle encoding scheme for cached tessellation. Historically, software rasterization precedes the existence of dedicated GPUs. Before we had the convenience of high performance geometry pipelines in hardware, let alone vertex and tessellation shaders, rasterization of images was done in CPU code, and most computer graphics students still implement this at some point. But with the modularity and programmability of modern GP GPUs, software rasterization is having a comeback on these massively parallel devices, because in many situations, actually using optimized software solutions and exploiting contextual knowledge or preprocessed information can achieve significant performance boosts at runtime. And we can see many instances of this, with individual stages of the fixed function pipeline being replaced by software solutions. One example of this is compute skinning for animated models, replacing conventional skinning done in the vertex shader. We can even replace entire pipelines, as has been shown by Kensel and colleagues recently. A particular noteworthy example is the Nanite feature of Unreal Engine 5, which uses a range of custom data structures, software rendering and culling techniques to achieve unprecedented performance and scalability for complex geometry. We can find specialized solutions for particular primitive types, as has been shown by Schütz and colleagues last year. But today we would like to focus on a very particular part of the pipeline, which is addressed in an article by Curie and colleagues from 2019, namely software tessellation. Their approach for taking a low poly mesh to a high resolution tessellated version is based on the use of longest edge bisection. Longest edge bisection, or LEB for short, follows a set of simple recursive rules and always subdivides edges in a rotating fashion, or put differently, always bisects the longest edge of the canonic isosceles right triangle. Based on this scheme, they propose adaptively subdividing input triangles. Each subtriangle resulting from this subdivision can be recreated with a series of transformations, each represented by a subdivision matrix. This matrix has only a single free parameter, which can be either 0.5 or negative 0.5. Thus, every tessellated triangle can be represented by a series of binary values, or rather a bit code. The length of the bit code implicitly identifies how many subdivisions occurred, thus it is possible to encode irregular tessellations with only a single integer per triangle. Let's take a closer look at what this proposed matrix actually does. The matrix operates in a homogeneous barycentric coordinate system. A1 is concatenated to the triangle's vertex coordinates and the different variations of the subdivision matrix then produce the tessellated subtriangles. As shown here, if all vertices are transformed by this matrix, choosing S as 0.5 causes V1 to move to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 in barycentric coordinates, while V3 moves to the origin. On the other hand, choosing S as negative 0.5 results in V2 moving to the origin. The final result, as we can see here, is depending on our choice of S, we either get the upper left or the lower right half of the original triangle and thus the tessellated triangles at the first level. We provide a small visualization of this procedure as the triangle is being decoded. As we can see here, the more subdivisions a triangle has undergone, the more transformations and the more work is necessary for the GPU to recover the tessellated triangle. Also note that if we want to maintain the compact memory footprint of this encoding, this recursive decoding procedure must be done for each triangle in every single frame. Let's quickly consider the strengths of this approach and whether it satisfies the requirements of the GPU. First of all, the keys for each individual tessellated triangle can be compactly stored in a primitive type with 32, 64, or maybe even 128 bits. Therefore, the approach lends itself to cache tessellation, where the result of the previous frame are likely to be valid in the next. 
The amount of subdivision is only limited by the number of bits in the types reserved for storage. So even when using a single integer per tessellated triangle, this means we can encode a much higher tessellation factor than the hardware pipeline can achieve. In theory, this is a suitable solution for applications with a high variation in detail, such as planetary scale rendering without having to switch representations. Unfortunately, the runtime of the approach scales with the amount of subdivisions, meaning that a triangle resulting from 128 LEB subdivisions also requires 128 matrix multiplications per vertex each time it is displayed. Furthermore, let's not forget that GPUs like predictable, uniform or easily balanced workloads. The absence of divergence simplifies the program flow and results in simple scheduling. Ideally, threads also receive uniform workloads so that entire workgroups can finish simultaneously and free up the SIMD resources for work that is yet to be scheduled. However, the runtime for decoding each individual triangle, as presented by Curie and colleagues, is directly dependent on its encoded key length. So if each thread is tasked with decoding and outputting a single triangle, this means that a single repeatedly tessellated triangle can keep an entire workgroup from finishing because its code takes so long to decipher. Can we perhaps instead find a constant time, similarly straightforward solution for triangle subdivision? Let's look at a different domain, namely quadtrees. For quadtrees, we can easily find a simple constant time solution for referencing individual nodes at arbitrary depths. Consider a quadtree with a given indexing scheme for its quadrants. Let's now interpret them in their binary form. The subdivision in a binary tree is of course recursive and we can produce indices for nodes at arbitrary depths by always repeatedly concatenating the appropriate index in binary form. If we are now given a particular index, how can we uncover its position and size in our 2D domain? Well, first of all, we can tell from the code length that 256 entries can be stored in it. For a quadri, this means the node must be at depth six, where nodes can be anywhere in a 16 by 16 grid. We can then take every bit in an even position and concatenate them to get the X coordinates and the bits in odd positions to get the Y coordinate of the cell in question. For longest edge bisection, we can do something similar to enclose a limited set of triangles at each tessellation level. Here we can see the results of a triangle uniformly tessellated with LAB to individual levels. For each of them, we can find a regular grid that encloses no more than two triangles. The next step towards our solution is realizing that there are different configurations in each cell that we need to distinguish. If we want to reference triangles by using grids, and we don't want to have our grid cells split LEB tessellated triangles, we need to support three different configurations. Two for cells that contain two triangles and one for cells that contain four triangles. Within each cell, the identification of a triangle can be done in a non-ambiguous way. In the two states, the triangle with index zero is the one occupying a left corner. For the four state, they are arranged in a rotated Z shape. Let's quickly check if our approach can handle the same use cases as the method by Curie and colleagues. We can easily confirm that for a regularly tessellated triangle, the proposed scheme enables us to identify each tessellated subtriangle. Each of them can be represented by the coordinates of a grid cell at the corresponding resolution and an index inside it. How about irregular tessellations? This is also not a problem, as long as each triangle implicitly knows which grid it belongs to. The tessellated subtriangles can be members of different grids as long as they cover the entire domain. The one thing we should note is that inside these grids, regardless of the resolution, half of their available locations are redundant because they actually fall outside of the original triangle. But we will get to that in a second. 
Let's now put these insights together and look at our proposed basic encoding scheme. It consists of four different parts. First, similarly to the encoding by Curie and colleagues, we have a most significant bit, or MSB for short, which we need to indicate the code length stored in the bits of a primitive type. Next, we have the index of the triangle inside the cell we are referencing. To make things easier, we assume that the grids we are dealing with have the same resolution in X and Y, so the cell coordinates will take up an even number of lower bits. Therefore, if the number of bits behind the MSB is odd, we know that this must be a code for a triangle in a two-state cell. If it is even, then it must be a code for a triangle in a four-state cell. After consuming the corresponding number of bits to get the index, we can directly use half of the remaining bits for the x-coordinate and the other half for the y-coordinate. This way, we already know the cell. In two state, we then only have to identify which state of the two we are looking at and then use the index to recover the encoded triangle. In four state, this is slightly simpler since there only ever is a single four state. This encoding scheme already works well and we could achieve some performance improvements with it, but it lacks elegance since actually half of the addressable space in each of the grids will never be used since it falls outside the original input triangle. This means we are effectively wasting one bit or in other terms, we only ever can store half the number of tessellated triangles that Curie and colleagues can with the same number of bits. The solution to this, however, is not too hard. Looking at an isosceles right triangle, we can realize that it covers the same area as a rectangle, where one side is half the side length of our grids. Therein already lies the solution to our problem. Starting from the initial subdivision, as soon as we reach the second tessellation level, we simply move the triangle in the lower right and artificially assign to it the coordinates that the non-existent tessellated triangle outside the original one would receive. This only requires the introduction of two special cases to our encoding scheme. If triangles are split at tessellation level 1, we give a hard-coded artificial index to the lower right triangle. Conversely, if this triangle is collapsed or it or one of its children is displayed, we account for this switch. We can easily do this by checking for triangles that seem to fall outside the original one, and then we know that they are part of this special case. Since now every tessellated triangle after level 1 falls inside a rectangular grid, where the vertical dimension is twice its horizontal, that means that if we use this method, we can actually only use one bit less for encoding x-coordinates. If we change our encoding scheme correspondingly, we immediately win back the bit that was previously lost. The performance benefits of our new encoding scheme have been assessed in the original OpenGL framework hosted by co-authors of Curie. We took their provided terrain rendering test case and compared the original encoding scheme against ours. At low terrain resolutions, both methods perform equally well and other workloads outweigh the benefits of the constant time complexity of our approach. However, at high terrain resolutions, where we use pixel-sized triangles, the efficient evaluation of our encoding creates a 40% performance gain on average. In applications that already have some significant arithmetic load, for instance, procedurally generated terrain, we could see improvements much earlier. For details, please see the short paper. Note that everything here stays the same, including the memory footprint. All that was changed is the method for storing and decoding the tessellated triangles in each frame. Our proposed encoding scheme can be used to speed up the original proposed method, enabling the efficient storage of arbitrarily LEB tessellated triangles. The compact storage makes it an efficient candidate for cache tessellation, where each sub-triangle's tessellation degree can be completely independent of its neighborhood. In practice, ideal tessellation levels in the mesh may be rather similar across triangles in close proximity. The recently proposed concurrent binary trees exploit this fact 
and store tessellation for entire groups of triangles even more compactly. Our new encoding scheme does not provide significant benefits in these cases. However, to support both uniform shapes as well as sparse, high-frequency geometry details, a hybrid software tessellation could be employed, which switches between these two approaches across complex meshes or terrain. Thank you for watching. Thank you.